Hi, my name is Johnny Gartner, and thank you so much for joining me for this week's episode of the Cedar 60 podcast. At Cedar 60, our mission is to engage with culture and politics from the distinctive lens of the gospel. Today's episode will attempt to address the Christian in the voting booth and how to make our vote count. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Caleb Smith from Cedarville University. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. Always a pleasure to be with you, Johnny. Uh, you were on with us earlier this season talking about voting rights, and I thought we'd continue that discussion similarly down the same path of elections, kind of addressing some of the hot topics. Uh, but it's May, coming up on May, it's not May yet, uh, but May is you know one of the big primary months in yep. the country. A lot of states have started early voting. Ohio's in the middle of a very contested Senate election. It's been in the news yep. uh, lately, also Pennsylvania. Um, so thought we'd kind of address um, maybe, you know, the, the uh, what's at stake in these elections, the, not just for the primaries, but also for the midterms in November, but also talk about how we as Christians can approach, you know, making our vote count uh, in a way that, you know, we can live with it with our consciences. So um, first thing we might do is just briefly reintroduce yourself to our guests, uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, as you said, my name is Mark Caleb Smith. I'm a professor of political science here at Cedarville University. I'm also the chair of the Department of History and Government and also the director of the Center for Political Studies. So I think that means I wear at least three hats at Cedarville and have been here for 17 years. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, if you could briefly, I guess, just introduce um, what midterm elections are for those people who may not know uh, and kind of talk about what that looks like for this year. So, I mean, a lot of people think of American politics from the perspective of presidential elections. So every four years we have one of those. And of course, we also have Senate elections every four years and House elections every four years. Uh, but between those presidential elections are what you called and what are, I think, the proper term that we usually use is midterm elections. And that's when all of the House, the U.S. House is up for grabs, as well as one third of the U.S. Senate. And then uh, a lot of states have elections, gubernatorial elections, uh, state House, state Senate elections. And so it's a pretty big election year, uh, and it's going to have a significant impact, no question, because midterm elections are sometimes historic, and sometimes you see significant change from them. I think we hear the phrase a lot that, oh, this is the most important election you know, in your life when it comes to presidential elections. Um, but you know, talk about midterm elections. There are some pretty key Senate seats that are up for grabs this year, um, and a lot of talk about a red wave that's going to come. Uh, you know, they talked about the blue wave in 2020. Um, right. So there's a lot of bold predictions about what the election results are going to be. Maybe if you could kind of address why those are being made, kind of some of the historical trends that happen with midterms within the first two years of a president's uh, administration. Yeah. Uh it's going to be an important election because, if anything, it will determine what kind of power Joe Biden has over the next two years. So uh, it will constrain the president or it will empower the president. It will make it easier or harder for him to pass his agenda. Uh, you can think of how it might affect potential court appointments and all those things as well. And so at the federal level, these elections are important. Obviously, at the state level, uh, they can be decisive. So if you're electing a governor and if you're electing a general assembly like we are here in Ohio, uh, these can be very critical elections and can shape the future. When you think of the federal level, uh, typically the president's party, so as you said, this is the president in the first year of his term, typically the president's party loses about 26 House seats and then five or six Senate seats on average. So if the Republicans perform up to average levels, uh, they should take control of the House and control of the Senate in 2022. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but just sort of if we think of them as, as an average, they have a really good chance. When we look at an election like this one, um, we, we talk about political climate, mm. sort of what is the political reality like, which party does it favor. Uh, right now, the climate is heavily toward the Republican Party, I would say, Uh Inflation is at generational levels um, that I really haven't seen in my lifetime, or at least that I remember in my lifetime. Uh, and that and inflation is something that's a really bad political issue for the incumbent party because it hits you every day. You go to the grocery store, you fill up your gas tank, you have to buy an appliance, you notice that things are more expensive, and it just affects you. Yeah. So inflation is a significant problem, I think, for the Democrats and for President Biden. Um, 
other things I think are, are difficult as well. President Biden's approval rating is around 41 percent, depending on what poll yep. you look at. It's a pretty low approval rating. Uh, President Obama's was around 48 percent at this point in his election, or his first midterm election, and he did, did very poorly in the 2010 elections. Uh, President Trump's is a little bit lower, but uh, he also didn't do all that well in that first midterm either. And so his approval rating is 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 slumbering around a little bit. Inflation is poor. Foreign policy doesn't help any right now. I mean, we have significant foreign policy crises. Uh, President Biden, you know, I think his impact on them is arguable. So the political climate, I think, heavily favors Republicans. Now, whether that'll translate into a significant gain, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 mm -hmm. seats even, it's a little bit too early to tell, probably. But I think all indicators are uh, the Republicans will do quite well in November. I, I think one of the trends we're seeing is more entrenched districts in some of these elections yeah. where seats that are up for grabs aren't as easy to change parties as they used to be in some circumstances, especially in the deep blue states like California and New York, where there's a lot of seats up for grabs, if that if you'd agree with that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think both parties have sort of taken redistricting to its logical conclusion. They've tried to make as many seats safe as possible for themselves and minimize the number of seats for their opponents. Republicans have had an advantage with redistricting for the past couple of decades, uh, but Democrats now control enough states to where they're asserting their own advantage. Mm -hmm. And you also have some states like Ohio and Florida, which are still a little bit out there. Who knows what's happening exactly? Mm -hmm. Ohio's plan keeps getting struck down by the Ohio Supreme Court. And so things are up in the air. And I think you're right. We could see smaller changes because redistricting has affected, I think, these elections differently. Yeah. I mean, in Ohio... Uh, there's going to have to be potentially another election after our first primary because the statewide map isn't complete yet. And so you can't particularly vote necessarily for the right person, which is kind of disastrous. So um, gerrymandering is definitely a big problem. It is. It's a massive problem. I think when you look at uh, American politics right now and think of the the difficulties, what makes it hard to get things done, mm -hmm. uh, gerrymandering, I think, is near the top of the list. I think it also kind of adds to this general unease that people have when they think about politics. I mean, you mentioned foreign policy. Uh, typically, those kind of things help, at least in the past, have helped boost a president's approval rating. 9-11 yep. boosted yep. George W. Bush's approval rating yep. through the roof. And we haven't seen that kind of level of uh, any substantial movement in President Biden's um, approval rating. I think a Quinnipiac poll came out this weekend that had him under 40 percent among young people, which is really unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you could just kind of talk about why, you know, I mean, I think it's easy to look at elections, you know, look at the 2020 election and say, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't vote for Trump or I voted for Trump and, uh, you know, think of the impact that has. And I think it is realistic to say that elections have real world consequences, but it's really hard to look at the candidate and, you know, say, I have to vote for this person or I, there's nobody else I can vote for or I can't bring myself to vote for this person. So if you could kind of talk about why this, this idea we talk about of how, you know, this is the most important election in history <laughs> is kind of problematic thinking when yeah. we come to these kinds of elections. Well, I think, first of all, uh, you know, every election can't be the most important. Mm -hmm. You know, if you listen to news sources in particular, uh, the last – several the last couple of decades really both parties sell their bases on this idea that this is the most critical election of your lifetime and uh, at some point you have to get wise to the you know to the gag here you have to think well this isn't quite credible because it doesn't ever seem to happen that way but elections can certainly be historic they can certainly change parties um, they can change the direction of the country. When you think of Supreme Court appointments, you think of other things. So they matter. Unquestionably, they matter. But I think they generally don't matter nearly as much as we think. Um, so think back, you know, for those of your listeners, uh, President Obama struggled his first two years in office to some extent. He did get a health care bill passed, which was significant. Uh, he lost 63 House seats in that first midterm election. His party lost 63 House seats. But he was reelected pretty comfortably yeah. in 2012. Uh, Bill Clinton loses over 50 House seats in his first midterm election. He gets fairly comfortably reelected in 1996. And so, you know, yeah, it can even be a disaster for Joe Biden. That doesn't mean he's going to lose the presidency in two more years. And so 
Uh, I think we tend to, to put too much emphasis on this next election all the time. But I think that's especially problematic because our, our leaders put so much emphasis on the next election all the time. So every piece of legislation is crafted under the idea, how's it going to affect the next election? Every discussion, every bill, every potential compromise, every vote, how's it going to affect the next election? Yeah, at one level, that seems healthy because they're thinking about what will the voters say, but it isn't really about protecting their own seat. It's more about how can we position the party in a way that makes it most competitive for the next election. That's a different question. Um, and I think it's I think it's made our politics somewhat toxic as a result. You know, I think we can we can be thankful that maybe we don't have more elections. You know, the founders at one point were thinking of of annual house elections, um, which would just be shocking to our system. I think thankfully we don't have that. So yeah, I think it's a significant issue. Elections matter, uh, but there's a lot more about politics than elections, and I think we need to broaden our scope a little bit. Yeah, I think even if, if you're a Republican or a conservative, it's even more exacerbated these tensions around elections because people are vying for President Trump's approval. It's been on full display in Ohio, and some people don't want it, and they're making a big deal of that. And it's been on display in Congress, which is surprisingly – the Republican Party in Congress is surprisingly unified over you know moving – just to win the elections right. over, you know, trying to deal with the Trump situation. So um, it's been very interesting to watch. But I think as Christians, you know, it's obviously a whole different topic. And I think um, I grew I was adopted from a country, you know, that doesn't have democratic systems. And so yep. I think it's a privilege that people don't often take into consideration when they're talking about the process. And so um, that is definitely one thing to keep in mind. I don't know if you have anything to say on that. But um I think as Christians, we walk into the voting booth and we forget our Christianity for a couple minutes and we say, I'm a Republican, just tick off every Republican on the ballot. Uh, so if you could kind of address just, you know, primarily what our thinking should be as Christians when we walk into the voting booth, like, you know, it, more than just, you know, this is the policy that matters, you know, abortion's a big issue and we tend to be one issue voters sometimes on right. the abortion issue and maybe yeah. why that isn't healthy for our political system. Or even for our witness. Yeah. Uh, a lot of great issues there, yeah. and I probably won't be able to address all of them, yeah. but certainly follow up if I don't address what yeah. you're thinking. But, you know, Paul, there is no letter written to people who are working, who are living in a democracy yeah. from Paul, yeah. right? He didn't write a letter um, to Christians who are in our situation. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have a clear biblical idea of what it means to step into a voting booth necessarily and what it means to have the people be sovereign mm -hmm. at some level mm -hmm. in a political system. We just don't see that reflected in scripture. Now there are clearly some biblical principles that we can bring to bear in that situation, but it's just a different kind of argument to make. Uh, I think when you look at the Old Testament in particular, you look at books like Amos and you look at other prophets, and then when you look at elements of the New Testament as well, I think it's clear that government has been tasked with doing justice. Mm. This very clear, um, you know, give people what they deserve, you know, reward the good, punish the evil. Well, we as, a, as voters have the opportunity to steer our government toward justice or away from justice. And so I think when we vote, we have to think about how we can impact our government that way. But our impact isn't decisive, right? We're, we're, we're relatively small. I think if we're really measuring evangelicals by reasonable standards, we're a relatively small group of people. Even if you give us the biggest numbers we could imagine, 20 to 30 percent of the population, yeah. big number at one level, but not big enough to control things, not big enough to have a decisive effect on one political party, much less the whole political system. And so we start with from a position not of dominance, but to some extent a position of weakness. And then we have to think through well, what kind of responsibility does that give me when I step into that voting booth? You know, I think that... Uh, you know, I often think of Matthew 16, Matthew 10, sorry, verse 16, uh, where Christ is sending out his disciples and he tells them he will send them out and he wants them to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And I think that's the attitude you have to take into the voting booth. You have to be wise. You have to be shrewd. Think about what your vote can mean, how it can affect policy potentially, how you can help select candidates to pressure favored positions. But on the other hand, how do you maintain your innocence in that process? How do you reflect your values? 
Uh, and I think you have to sort of weigh both of those things when you walk into the voting booth. I think all too often we typically think of, well, how can I affect the system yeah. as opposed to how does my vote maintain my own purity and my own sense of morality? And so I think you have to keep both of those things in hand at the same time when you cast votes as much as you can. But, you know, there's no perfect candidate. There's always going to be a flawed person sitting in front of you that you're trying to choose between. And I think the problem that I have, you know, you said one issue voting is a, is a problem. I agree with you. But the reason that it's a problem is because it doesn't help you make a decision within a primary. Mm-hmm. You know, and all the candidates are on one position when it comes to life, let's say. Yeah. You don't have any reference point now. So now how are you going to vote? What's going to be your standard? And I think we need to look at things like competence, things like in- integrity and character. Um, and we need to weigh all those factors together and think about what kind of person should best represent not just me, but ideally in a perfect world, the kind of person that will bring glory to God yeah. as they're in office. Now, again, you don't always have that easy choice where one person's clearly the, the God yeah. – the more God-centric candidate and the other one is not. Uh, but I think those are the kind of factors we at least have to consider. You made some really amazing points. I think one of the other struggles that goes along lines of what you've been talking about is, you know, we live in a pluralistic society where, you know, our beliefs aren't the central ideology of culture. And so right. that also brings another issue to bear, which is addressed a little bit more in the New Testament than, you know, democracy is. Um, but it, it, it brings into... A really difficult situation to kind of character the level of character and integrity and humility that you expect in the people right. you're voting for. So if you could kind of talk about maybe realistic expectations <clears throat> for the candidates. I, I've talked to people all the time who think that our system is corrupt beyond repair and that it doesn't matter who they vote for because they're going to go to Washington or the state right. house and they're going to do whatever yeah. benefits them, which is a really – I personally think a disastrous way to view the system and yeah. founded in, you know, good things that are true, but nonetheless problematic for the way we approach engagement. So I think you have to begin this whole discussion with an understanding of how politicians think. Yeah. I'm not a politician. I'm probably not. A, if I were, I'd be a bad politician. <laughs> so, But I think you have to understand politicians respond to incentives just mm-hmm. like anyone else does. And so they respond to votes. And if you see voting in your party and in your district go a certain direction, then you're responsive to that. And so uh, our elected officials are, whether we like it or not, a reasonable reflection of who we are. Yeah. We get what we vote for. Yeah. And if we're, if we're troubled about what we see in our system, it's because we haven't made good decisions when we've cast our ballots. So if you don't like elected officials who are trolls – professional trolls, if you don't like uh, elected officials who are demagogues, um, if you don't like elected officials that have a hard time telling the truth or being accountable or responsible, then ultimately that's our fault. And so, you know, I think we have a really big issue in our country when it comes to how we make these kinds of decisions. And again, there's nothing wrong with being practical about it at some level, but you have to understand being practical has consequences. Those are incentives that those people are responding to. And the vote is really your only meaningful input into the system, unless you have billions of dollars or, you know, you have a significant amount of power in some other way. And so that vote is a is a precious resource. And to me, when you when you spend it, you should have a pretty good idea of what you want to accomplish in that process. Uh, You know, I take comfort in the fact that in the end of the day, and it's kind of a a cold, rational, economic look at it. At the end of the day, my vote isn't going to settle the election. Right. So I, I have some freedom to vote how I wish. And I also have to take comfort in the fact that God ultimately orders these governments as he sees fit. Mm. You know, no one's going to win an election and the process surprise God. And so because of that, I think I should feel some flexibility to vote how I think is best as opposed to feeling pressured or constrained about what the political system looks like. I think I often find on this podcast that there is – topics off of discussions that we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about. But I think the the idea of a two-party system is kind of constrained the growth our sure. political system can have and in some <clears throat> ways damaged it, yep. in other ways benefited it. But I think people, at least in my experience, and even I've thought this in some circumstances, think that you know they have to vote for their candidate, their party's candidate. Right. Right. 
Is that true? And if not, what is the danger in thinking that you have to vote for your party's candidate just because that's the only chance they have of when you know you have of your ideals being represented, w- with good evidence suggesting that you yeah, know because right. there's a lot of disastrous policies happening right now. Yeah. Uh, over voting for someone who you think is more qualified and has more character and integrity. <laughs> So this is the classic uh, don't waste your vote, yeah. right? Don't go into the voting booth and waste your vote on a third party or a candidate that has no chance of winning. Uh, and, and there's some truth to that, obviously, right? I mean, there's some truth to that, that you when you go in there and cast a ballot for someone that you know has no opportunity, uh, then you are sending a signal. Uh, but I think you you need to send those signals personally. You know, I don't feel all that persuaded by the don't waste your vote philosophy, Um I think you need to vote in a way that best reflects your values and best best reflects how you'd like to see our political system yeah. function. And I get, I get, you know, if you go and you vote libertarian, for example, uh, you're probably not having much of a significant effect of some kind. But you know, I still think that vote is an opportunity to reflect your own values, and I, you know, I think we should take that seriously. Yeah. And so, um, to me, I want to send a message to politicians that I'm either happy with what they're doing or not happy with yeah. what they're doing. And if I continue to vote for the same thing over and over again, my message is I'm happy. Yeah. Whether it's true or not, I'm telling them that I'm happy through my yeah. vote. And so, and votes at the end of the day are far more important to politicians than polls or anything else because votes are what keeps them in office or not. Yeah. And so, you know, I think we need to take that opportunity robustly. I'd like to see the system reformed. You know, I'd like to see um, some modifications that would allow third parties to have more of an effect potentially, or maybe restructuring of how we do primaries and other things to make it a different process. But right now, due to gerrymandering and other factors, the system just doesn't work the way it was designed to. I think I have a, uh, I don't know, a controversial opinion on term limits, which is a whole other discussion that we'll talk about. But I think term limits for, you know, some positions are definitely important, but as a broad idea, I have this idea that we already have term limits in places right. called elections. That's right. And I think yeah. people place altogether too much significance on elections and don't place enough significance on elections also. And I yeah. think that who I vote for is a very important representation of what I want to be represented on the national stage. And if I think more people took that <clears throat> into consideration, that democracy is the representation of what the people want right. and that we as Christians have power – to change culture and society. We yeah. don't have to follow the mainstream conservative political ideology right. and who we vote for and that we do have a lot of sway in elections. And I mean that's historical. Like you know, evangelicals quote unquote have sure. had a lot of significance yeah. and impacts. Yeah. And so I think along the lines of what you're saying at least and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems to me like we have more than just a piece of paper on a ballot when we vote. It's it's more than just that. It's a representation of what we as a person participating in the democratic process think is important and represents our values. And I think to me when people say, oh, my vote doesn't do anything, it's just one vote, right. is improper understanding of how the process works. And right. maybe that's just me thinking – you know, being hopelessly romantic about the system. <laughs> but do you have any thoughts that you would add to that or detract maybe? I mean, I think that when you when you vote, that communicates one thing. When you wear a – when you put a bumper sticker on your car or fly a flag outside of your house, that communicates something as well, right? Um, now, you can keep that vote private, yeah. I suppose. Like you don't have to tell people. You don't have to wave a flag outside of your house. You don't have to indicate who you voted for. Uh, but you know, I've always approached it like I want to feel good about the vote so that if I'm asked, I can say, yeah, this yeah. is who I voted for and I can defend that and I can be comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to vote sheepishly if I can help it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to slink away or rationalize or say, well, yeah, I understand this. But at the end of the day, I had to do this instead. Uh, I'd rather be proud of my vote to the extent that I can. And so – I think it does communicate something to the world, unquestionably. And to that extent, uh, voting can be something of a witness that you have to people. But I also recognize that it, this is a, especially when you look at general elections, there's just not a lot of choices. In a primary, you have choices in front of you. And I think those primary elections where you really have your best opportunity to exercise an effect on your party. Um, and if you just continue to vote for the same kind of person in the primary, then your party gets a certain message and a signal about that as well. So, yeah, I see it as a moral choice that you make. And I think it's a reflection of your values to a great extent. 
Um, to me, that's far more important than the other part of it. But you know, I think in that sense, you and I are probably equally naive and idealistic. But I'm okay with that, right? I, I can live with it. <laughs> I can look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, I made this choice. I'm happy about this choice. I can defend yeah. this choice and be comfortable with it and walk away. I think it falls under the broader topic of civic engagement, which, again, is a whole nother topic right. that we could talk about. But I think one of the errors that we've seen on the national stage, from America at least, is this wandering away from local and state government towards a, you know, yeah. an intense focus yeah. on yeah. federal um, uh, political power, involvement, those kinds of things. We talk a lot about call your senator now, you know, right. call your congressman, but we don't right. ever talk about calling your local <laughs> congressman, your no, local generally correct. assembly member. That's exactly right. So, you know, Cedarville students are required to take a, a class during their time here called Politics and American Culture, yep. but civic engagement doesn't end there. It's, right. It starts there. Right. So if you could talk about ways that we can engage civically from, you know, volunteering on a school board, running to run, you right. know, work on a school board, right. uh, to all sorts of other things that historically have been part of the political institutions in our country and are seemingly dying away. Yeah. So I, I, I'm happy to answer that question, but I want you, and maybe you've already told your podcast listeners this, I don't know, but you've worked in, the, on, in offices on Capitol Hill, right? Yeah. And so what does it mean when someone emails their senator or calls their senator on the phone? You've been part of that process. Yeah. What is what happens with that phone call? What happens with that email? Yeah, well, I think it is one of the misconceptions that people have yeah. when they say, "I call my congressman and they don't do anything about right. it," right. because I worked in a member's office who got thousands of phone calls every day, and yeah. we recorded all of them and tallied them and said, "This is what our constituents care about," and then the member reads those and considers those, and it doesn't always mean he's going to vote just you know one hundred percent how the people he represents want him to. Right. Uh, he or she, I should say. Right. Uh, but I think people have this misconception that people go to Washington and they no longer care about what the people in their state think. Right. And, and maybe that's what you were going to talk yeah. about. But I right. think uh, it does matter and people do listen because they, right. ultimately their power rests upon the people yeah. being – uh, comfortable and, you know, uh, I can't think of the word, uh, content with how right. they voted right, and right. how they lead. Yeah. And so yeah. I think we can take into <clears throat> account the power of our vote, but also yeah. the account of the power of our engagement because people hear it and it rings loudly. So they listen to it. They yeah. tally it. They reflect on the feedback to, to some extent. But they're reflecting on numbers on a spreadsheet yeah. for the most part, right? Yeah. Here are the number of phone calls I got. Here's the issue. <laughs> Here's which side they're yeah. on. And that's fine. That's yeah. That's not nothing. Yeah. Um, but it isn't um, it isn't the effect you can have on other parts of politics, yeah. as you're saying. Uh, you know, in Cedarville is an unusual place. I live in Cedarville. It's a village. It's aptly l l labeled a village, right? <laughs> you know, less than five thousand people, or around five thousand people, live here, and so I can go um, sit and get my hair cut by the mayor of Cedarville, yeah. right? Yeah. The barber who's also the mayor, and I can have conversations with him directly about issues that are happening within the village. Well, most people live in an environment, even if they live in a big city, they have a city council member, mm -hmm. they have other people who are representing them at a lower level of government. They can have far more of an effect on than yeah. sending an email or a phone call to a member of the United States Senate or the U.S. House. You can also build relationships with those people, get to know them, show up yeah. at events, show up at party functions, yeah. volunteer for your political party, volunteer for a local campaign, yeah. make those connections and start to have an effect in that particular way. It's way more effective, I think, on the whole. As you sort of referenced, uh, Tip O'Neill's famous "All politics is local." You know, I think that's still true to a great extent because local politics affects your life way more yeah. than national politics, generally speaking. But because of the media sources that people consume, they now focus so much on national politics. I think they've forgotten to some extent yeah. the importance of those city council races and those school board races yeah. and other factors, and so. I think you can have a significant effect um, at those local levels if you just take the time to get involved in the process. Yeah. But to be pointed about it, that's not just sitting and watching news. Yeah. You have to be actively involved, going yeah. to do things, showing up, giving your time, giving your resources to have an effect. Yeah. I think you can do it. I think you'll also note if you do that, that these are human beings yeah. who are making really hard decisions, who are in stressful situations. For many of them, it's not their primary job. Yeah. And so... Uh, I think you'll see them as human beings in a way that maybe will change your view of politicians across the spectrum. Yeah. I think now we typically see politicians as sort of avatars yeah. of greatness or, or horror, depending yeah. on which party we yeah. prefer. 
there are human beings who are making hard choices, even the really well-intentioned ones. They're just they're just struggling to get through and make choices in a difficult environment. And that's true at the local level. It's true at the federal level as well. So I think there's a lot you can do to impact the system uh, far beyond your state capital and beyond the uh, Washington, D.C. as well. Yeah, I think – um, if you there's a lot of issues right now. I mean, critical race theory was at right. the center of the Virginia gov- gubernatorial election. I think if you think critical race theory is a problem, you know, who you vote for at the federal level is going to have an impact. But, you know, going to the school board and talking about it in their next meeting is going to have much more of an impact. It will. More of an impact if you get 10 parents to come to the meeting and sign a petition. And, no you question. Know, these are kinds of things that make a and more immediate impact than who you vote for in Congress. And there's a whole plethora. If you think wasteful spending is happening in in government right. in general, make more much more of an impact going to your city right. manager or, you know, sitting yeah. at a town council meeting than That's there right. is gonna be yeah. you know, who you vote for. And I think we've seen less and less people attending these meetings that used to have lots of people attend them yeah. regularly. And and I think it's having a, a disastrous impact on civic engagement as a whole. And letting leaders, you know, make decisions that maybe otherwise they wouldn't because there's right. nobody holding them to account. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that you've highlighted sort of an, a classic argument we're having in social science right now uh, about the nature of civic engagement, the decline of civic engagement, the decline of what we call social capital, this yeah. sort of resource that we all have by making connections and networks in our communities. Right now, we tend to see ourselves much more individualistically, mm-hmm. and then maybe, if not individualistically, much more tribally in terms yeah. of, well, I have a party attachment. And that's important. I don't want to denigrate that. But you have so many other associations you yeah. could be pursuing uh, that will have much more of an effect, I think, in the long term. So, yeah, I, I think that you're right. I think, you're, I think your advice is spot on. But it is a bit of a crisis. It is. It's a bit of a crisis. And so we have to be willing to be engaged at that level. Yeah. And I think really that means getting involved, building relationships, trying yeah. to do hard things at that local level first. And then I think that'll have an effect. Yeah. You know, I tend to think that real change in the system comes from the bottom up. Yeah. And it has to be sort of a grassroots cultural effect on the system yeah. that'll eventually make it make an impact. But to me, a presidential election is not the best way to change the system. Yeah. I think other factors work better. I think the the phrase I used at the beginning of the episode was, how do we engage in the voting booth? And and I think what you've helped us arrive at is that your civic duty, your political power doesn't start at the voting booth. It ends at the voting booth. Yeah. And you have so many more capable – you have so much more power as a member of a pluralistic democratic society uh, to engage and to change the outcomes by you know more than just saying I have to vote for this person because this is my only chance to make a difference on the system. Yeah. Yep. And I think you've helped us iter- iterate that that's not necessarily true. So, I hope so. It's always, it's always a pleasure. Um, it's always fun to talk with you all and it's good – good discussions. It always feels like it goes too fast. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it, as always. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Cedar 60 podcast. Make sure you follow us on all major podcast platforms, social media. We hope you'll join us next time as we continue to explore politics from the distinctive ones of the gospel. Thank you so much.